This is lesson five of uh, Foundations of Postgres and Timescale. I'm David Cohn. Um, uh, I'm uh, heading up uh, engineering education at Timescale. Um, and Miranda. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Miranda All, and I'm a developer advocate. Um, I come from a non-traditional tech background, so a lot of kind of the really fundamentals and database stuff that David is going through is new to me as well, many of the things. So um, I'm really excited to be here and learn alongside all of you guys and girls, just people, um, <laughs> and really excited to, uh, yeah, the, I, I just, I feel like I've learned so much from this um, series already. Um, and I would encourage you also, any viewers, ask questions throughout the series or throughout the, the stream. Um, I'll probably ask my own questions and also maybe make some clarifications of things, at, at how I learned them, or maybe just, you know, some extra tidbits of information. But definitely uh, just throughout the lesson, feel free to ask questions and I'll kind of help um, give those questions to David. Um, and guide like conversation stuff. So feel free to do that as well. Yep. Yeah, please, please do. And and Miranda, thank you so much for for being here and doing that. It's such a huge help, um, and really great to get your questions uh, and 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 um, and break up the monotony of my voice. Um, so I love your voice. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Miranda, you said okay. So you said you were going to read this quote. Oh quotation. yes. You can you can do that now. Um, all right. <laughs> as long as you won't like flip through the slides on me. I will I will try try to avoid that. <laughs> all right, we shall not cease from exploration. And to the end of all our exploring, we will we be will be <laughs> to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So if anyone watching has a guess of who this is or knows who it is, I will actually be rather impressed. It's relatively obscure. Um uh but uh, it's a quotation that was sort of burned into my head. It's it's from T. S. Eliot um, in in Four Quartets. Um, T. S. Eliot is a um, famous sort of modernist poet. I don't know exactly how to describe him, but uh, there there's some really lovely things. The the this this quotation in particular though um, was something that that I, I did a lot of theater in high school. Um, and, I did not know that. Uh, yeah, so that's I, awesome. I did, um, uh, and and this was a quotation that that my my theater teacher liked. So I I, I actually I was home last week, so you actually get to see pictures yeah. of baby David. Um, uh, <laughs> David. This this was my freshman year in Man of La Mancha uh, as a muleteer. Um, so this is the proof that I, I did a lot of theater in high school. This was my senior year. You can see I got the beard by then. Um, this is amazing. Uh, and also I have to, you know, anything from my yearbook that says, isn't he lovely? I have to, to just, you know, celebrate it because, uh, man, that, that feels great. Uh, I didn't even realize that, that, that it said, like, I, I, I certainly didn't remember this. Um, I looked back. I'm just thinking, like, isn't oh, he lovely? <laughs> we'll just re redo the song. Isn't he <laughs> this is amazing. I, um, <laughs> so uh, you get you get uh, you get that, but this was an important quotation for for actually some of the the sort of uh, movement theater sort of stuff that we did, which was more dance like, um, and we did a lot of sort of improvisation, which we would then take and m work into a piece, um, and and this was this this quotation in particular informed my theater teacher's sort of uh, philosophy on a lot of this which was that as you were working on a piece or something like this, you would start from a place of innocence. So you would Im improvise something and like, mm -hmm. you know, there would be a lot of crap, but there would be some places where you just captured, where, where you really got into something, where you just captured something and there would be a moment um, that you would take and you would say, okay, this moment like was really beautiful. Right. So there was a, a sense of curation or something like that. And, and you would take that and then you would build it into a piece. And of course, that moment was really beautiful, but it also came in this context where you just like it happened. 
right? And so then you would try and do it again. And we called like uh, called this experience. We also sometimes called it, you know, it's also called rehearsal, but uh, it was also called sometimes being stuck in the mud because you're trying to recapture that sense of innocence and capture something of what it was the first time. It was often really hard um, mm. to, to get back to that. Um, and eventually by the time we were actually ready to perform this and build it into a piece and, you know, make all the transitions work and all of that, you would get to something like experienced innocence. Um, and you could actually refine that, um, that, 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 that the sense of whatever the move or whatever it was, as if you were experiencing the first time and, and recapture some of that beauty. Um, and so that's, that's like a process that I have found actually just incredibly useful for uh, honestly, almost any, everything that I do, right? Like it, it, it describes so much of what I feel like um, uh, happens in, in life more generally that you do like you, you encounter something it's, oh my God. And then you try and do it again. And you're like, well, that didn't quite work. And eventually you're able, like, as you practice, you're able to recapture some of that. So mm -hmm. We're on lesson five of of uh, of of our of 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 uh, foundations of Postgres and Timescale. Why is this uh, relevant here? Well, it's actually because I'm going to re-give uh, a presentation that I gave at Postgres Build, which I also gave, uh, I think, actually on this channel at one point or some some version of it mm -hmm. um, about aggregation. I think we're reaching a point where that's useful. Um, it. And the reason that I'm giving it today is because it kind of touches on everything. There's like a lot of stuff there. And I want to use it as a vehicle to figure out the stuff, the, 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 the elements that we're still missing. So I think that this, 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 uh, we'll, we'll be able to come back to that later and it'll make more sense. So I hope that we can get to the point where this is going to make more sense or where at least with the other stuff, you can go back to it yourself and suddenly it will make more sense. I've also tried to, um, to, to, to call out some of those times um, here to help re remind me of like, this was part of the inspiration for this course in general was doing this type of work and saying, oh, this is a really cool thing. And like, there are all of these other bits that come off of it that I feel like in order to have a really, like I can give you the high level understanding and I can make it accessible, but there's a lot of other stuff underneath it that really give it even an, another layer of meaning. So I feel a little bit like I'm in that experience portion of this course um, as well. And so I wanted to have a little bit of time to, 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 to get back to the roots and try to uh, like figure out where I should be going with it. And I would really love your help. So if you can tell me as I identify some of the things or if you identify some of the, the gaps or wherever else, if you can put in the comments or somewhere else, what it is that you really wanna explore more, that would be really helpful for 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 going forward. Yeah, so, so you can't you can't just sit and watch, folks. You gotta you gotta participate. I'm just kidding. You don't have to. Yeah, but and, and even greatly appreciate and, it. <laughs> yes, and that's and that's whether you're watching it live or if you're watching it, um, you know, we'll we'll try and make this uh, available, you know, tomorrow or whatever. Um, I think we had a little bit of a delay in the last one. Hopefully, we can uh, make that available a little sooner. Um, uh, and please feel free to leave comments even a little bit later. That would really help still. So without further ado. Uh, do we do a drum? Boom. Without further ado. Um, how Postgres aggregation works and how uh, to create and use custom aggregates. Um, so we're going to go through a few things in this talk. The first is how Postgres aggregation works through pictures. We'll talk a little bit about the create aggregate statement. I'm going to you know, blow through that a little bit. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about custom aggregates with SQL and, and, and Rust, but mostly I want to get then to two-step aggregates, which is the design pattern that we have for effective custom aggregates that we use for timescale toolkit and hyperfunctions. Um, so let's start with how Postgres aggregation works through pictures. Um, and I talked about uh, Mr. Thornton, my uh, high school theater teacher, uh, who I, I really loved and was really affected by. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, that this is actually an homage to uh, Bruce Momjin's lovely uh, explaining Postgres internals through, through pictures talks. Um, he also often wears bow ties. So this is my uh, homage, homage. I don't know which way you're supposed to say it, but this, yeah, this I'm bow not tie, the person to ask. <laughs> me wearing a bow tie. Um, oh my God. Really? Come on. 
<laughs> All right, folks, we're done. Bye. We're done. That was quick. Uh, <laughs> man. Um, man, that was the quickest lesson ever. The whole lesson was okay, just try on again. David's <laughs> it's just a, I, I have a compact keyboard, and the end <laughs> button is right above the next arrow. I should probably just use the, the space bar, right? The space bar works. Okay. So I'm going to use the space bar from now on so that I don't accidentally hit the end button again. Okay. Um, uh, so honestly, what would one of these lessons be without me screwing up the slides at least uh, several times? Um, so. It's what we love about it. <laughs> um, so let's get started. So first off, the difference between an aggregate and a function. And we haven't really even talked about functions, um, uh, though I think we've used some of them in some of our, uh, like as we've discussed some things. Um, but the basic difference between an aggregate and a function um, is that an aggregate, like sum or count, is working over multiple rows, whereas a function, like uh, um, greatest or like uh, lower, for strings, right? Which makes things lowercase. Like those work one uh, row to one result. So, um, so essentially, let's let's look at that, and we'll we'll talk about uh, you know max versus greatest, right? So max is uh, or greatest, let's say, is getting you the larger of two values for each row. So if we have a table with bar and baz, uh, a table foo with bar and baz, um, and we have two uh, like a few values in that table, um, we can see that actually in, in each of these cases, it's uh, baz is larger than bar. And so we would get baz in each case. We'd get two, four, and six, which is the largest in each of those rows. Um, whereas uh, max of bar and max of baz will give us the greatest value of each of those over all of the rows. So aggregates are working on all the rows to uh, like put together or almost on a column-ish, um, whereas a function is working on each of the rows uh, in turn. So as I'm thinking about some of the things that 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 we could add in or like where where our understanding of this would get would could get deeper is that we could talk about custom functions and custom aggregates and custom types which are some of the things I did it again. Man, <laughs> I'm supposed to use the space bar. The space bar, David. Use the space bar. <laughs> um, so there's some of the things that make Postgres into an object relational database rather than just a relational database. So those custom functions and aggregates and types, those are those are one thing that we could get a little bit deeper into. We're going to do a little bit about custom aggregates here. I think it'll give you some background, but there's more that we could do if that were if that were interesting to folks. Um, okay, so uh, if we're doing this, we're going to we can say select max bar from foo. Um, and that's going to go over all of the rows and it's going to give us the result. But how does it actually do that, right? It's not actually taking all of the rows at once. Um, it's actually taking each, each row at a time. Um, Jay, if you could put in the comments, um, if you're interested in something, say what you're interested in because it is not always linked to timestamp, I think. Um, uh, or a timestamp of the video, and it will be much harder for me to figure out what you are interested in. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, and anyone else, please do that. Uh, <laughs> um, so as so let's look at how this will actually get 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 processed. So we start off, we have our rows with bar being one, two, and three, and we're going to get the max of bar. So we want to take the greatest, essentially, of, of each one. And we're going to have some state that we keep as we are, not embarrassing. Um, Jay, don't worry at all. Uh, it's totally fine. Um, so we start off with our state, which is sort of how we're what we're using to keep track of what's going on as we process these rows, being null. And as we process rows, we update our state with the largest one that we've seen. That's how we're going to do our max function. So as we keep processing rows, um, we keep getting a larger one, and our state keeps getting updated with the larger row. Cool. So we process each row, we update our state, um, and then we output the result. Right? Our result here is that the max is 3. Cool. That was pretty easy. So that function that is doing that work is called the state transition function. 
right? And it, because it's updating the state. Easy enough. Usually it's just it's shortened to, to transition function. Sometimes you'll also see it as S func for state transition function. Um, so that is, uh, that's what that function does. Now, this is all happening, by the way, in the executor. And this is this reminded me of another thing that would help us understand a bit more of uh, what's actually going on here. So where is this aggregation happening? It's happening in the executor. We're not going to go into it in this talk. But this is another thing that we could expand on and we could try to understand more of what's going on. It would also help to know about the planner. Um, it would uh, help us talk about the volcano model of, of, of uh, plan execution and other sorts of stuff. So that's um, that's another area that we could get into some more. OK, so let's oh, go back to aggregates. Wants, oh, oh, I was just going to inject that if anyone wants to talk about those topics that David just mentioned, you should yeah. add it to the chat either um, right so now interested or interested in executor or planner or whatever else. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm interested in this volcano method planning that you said because sure. I've, so, I've not heard of that. So maybe for cool. next another time. I don't know. <laughs> Good to know. Um, OK, so what about aggregates with a bit more complex state? So we we started with max, and there you're just tracking the same thing, right? And and, and we're outputting the same thing. Um, but for something like average, we actually need to take the sum and the count, and then we need to divide them. Um, so that requires. Uh, am I going to cover what, uh, Plamen? I, I I'm not going to cover the executor this time. But uh, so part of what this this one is 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 doing is. Uh, going going over aggregates in high level form, but trying to introduce some things that we could like look into further in future lessons. So you're interested in in covering more about the executor sometime later is what it sounds like, and that's great. We'll do that in a, awesome. in a future lesson. I'll work on that. One is around the super helpful executor. information. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. We will take note. Cool. Note yeah. taken. <laughs> okay, so we have something with more complex state. So there, our state then is going to be the sum of the count. And as we process our our rows, we update our state, right? With you know, in this case, one and one, and then eventually one, it'll be three and two. Yeah. So so our sum and counts will just get updated properly as we process each of the rows. Our transition function continues to work. It's obviously a different transition function in this case because it needs to do something different than max. Um, but then, well, for max, we could just um, uh, output. Our current state, but but you don't want that for average. You actually want to do something and get the actual result, which is the sum divided by the count, and the result is two. But I, if I so if I just output six three, it's not what you want. So there's another function uh, that gets called there, and that is called the final function. Um, you'll sometimes hear us talk about aggregates being finalized, and so this is like with average, you track the sum and the count. That's your state. And the, the transition function does that. And then the final function gets called at the end. We want to output something and does the division part in this case or whatever else, right? This is, you can generalize this to other aggregates. Okay. So that's the final function. Um, and in pseudocode, what this basically means is that our, our transition function is going to calculate our next state from our current state and the current value. And our final function is going to calculate a result from a final state. And those states can be arbitrarily complex, right? Um, the states could be lots of different things. Um, but th essentially, this is what the functions are doing inside of the aggregate. So one thing that you should know about that is that the transition function is usually significantly more expensive than the final function. Why is that? Well, the transition function is called much more often. Right? It's called once per row, whereas the final function is only called once per group of rows. So when we say something's expensive, another thing that we could talk about, by the way, right, is how does the database determine what's going to be expensive, what's not expensive? We could talk about the planner um, and the ways that it interacts with the executor and some of the other stuff that that, that happens. Um, so, for instance, we're about to talk about parallelism. How does that like? How do we decide when we want parallelism or not? 
um, those types of topics are uh, potentially interesting for us to explore at some point in the future. Um, but let's get back to our narrative of the main talk here. So one of the things that the planner, but we won't talk about that. What if one of the things that Postgres can do in order to limit the cost of the transition function or make things run faster is actually parallelize the execution of the transition function. So we can have um, multiple instances uh, and we can talk about you know, I'm using specific terminology here so as not to get too deep into the weeds on this, but we can start, we can go over some of the parallelism and concurrency stuff um, so that you know a little bit more about how these background workers and other stuff work and what happens there. Um, so each of the instances will then get some of the rows. I introduced some more rows here so you can see, and they're each going to run our transition function. So now because each of them is running the transition function, we can process them in parallel and it's gonna take less time for the user. Um, and so we keep updating our state. Um, and until we run out of rows, right? There's no more rows here. But then we have a final function that expects a, a single result, right? A single state and, and produces, um, uh, and will produce a single result. It doesn't know how to deal with multiple states. And I can't run my transition function because it turns out putting two states together is different, like it's a different operation than if I have a state and a new value, right? That's what the transition function does, right? So this putting two states together is another operation or combining them, right? And that's with something called a combined function, kind of obviously named in some, in some ways, or it, it was good named, uh, well named, I should say, right? So um, essentially the combined function can be run multiple times, but it will take multiple partial states and produce a combined state out of it. And the, the, once we have finished doing all of the com combination, then we can run our final function and get a result. So essentially once we have processed all of our rows, we combine things, we go to our combined function. And that combines our two states, right? In this case, we're adding both values, whereas in the transition function, we added to the sum and we just counted with the count. In the, the, the combined function here is going to add the sums and add the counts, right? So it's a slightly different function in this case. And then we can run our final function and get a result. Great. So that's good. So, and I mentioned this already, but we could talk about how parallel workers work, how the background worker framework works, how our jobs that like fit into that versus the, the parallel workers that run during queries um, and the various pools. This was actually one of the first things that I worked on at Timescale um, were our like scheduling stuff. And it turns out it's a real pain in the ass um, and, uh, and really, freaking complex and it was like oh this will be a good beginner project like there's examples of this in the in the postgres code base of how you can use background workers um and then i was you know i spent months on it and it turns out it's very complex mostly because of the ways that uh things interact between clusters and databases and state and all sorts of other weirdness anyway another story for another day um so Let's talk about some other ways that we can speed up aggregation. We don't just have to use parallelism. One thing we could do is actually use deduplication. So if we see the same aggregate called multiple times, we can choose, we can say like, look, I don't want to run this transition function so many times. I don't want to run this aggregate so many times. I'm just going to um, actually remove one of like run the, run the, the function once. Um, uh, also, we do have a really good question yeah. here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share it to the screen. But is this process related to time scale or is it how Postgres works? This is an excellent question, um, yeah. Plamen. So thank you for uh, asking this. So this first part is entirely about how Postgres works and how aggregates work in Postgres generally. Um, later in the talk, we'll get into how we apply this, um, especially in with hyper functions. Uh, in particular, and some of the aggregates, the custom aggregates that we've developed. Um, so we'll get to that in just a, a little bit later in the talk. Yeah. So thank you for this question and uh, kind of both, or really yeah. will be both. <laughs> yeah. And 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 to be clear, all of the, uh, this, this applies to any timescale um, 
aggregate as well, including some of the ones that we see, which means you end up with weird levels of analysis, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, this is generally how, how Postgres aggregate works and the Postgres aggregates work. And, you know, this was one of the things that it took me a little while to understand about Postgres aggregates and exactly what was going on there. But once I understood it, A, I thought it was a really interesting way that they designed them um, in order to make parallel aggregation work and other sorts of stuff. Um, and it's it can be very powerful for thinking about how we design our aggregates um, when we write our custom aggregates or you as a user might write custom aggregates of your own. Um, and so that's part of what I want to um, uh, explain here is sort of the design pattern that we use that we actually derive from this um, to make our own custom aggregates fit into this framework nicely and actually expose more of that to the user. So um, cool. So. So we decided that, that that this was expensive. So the planner can actually say, I'm only going to call this once. I'm only going to run the average once, and then I'm going to divide it by two. Um, and you can imagine that there could be more complex calculations around that. Um, there are also ways where the, 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 and this is something we could go over, like it turns out you don't actually need to have the same aggregate. You only need to have aggregates with the same final function. But it's a little hard to tell when that is and when it can do that and blah, 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 blah. So we'll talk about that. Another oh, time. also, um, oh, never mind. No, um, you, yeah. never mind. Never mind. Cool. You're going to go into it just now. I, my question was, there. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so we'll calculate the average once and then we'll be able to reuse the result sort of later in the, in the query. And that doesn't happen all the time. That doesn't happen with all functions. It actually only happens with aggregates because they're more expensive. Um, so there are many functions that, that Postgres in theory could do this for. Oh, actually, um, I think you skipped. And it does um, depend on the volatility marking of the functions. So that's another thing that we could go over volatility markings and other sorts of fun stuff with that. What did I skip? Oh, I was just gonna say um, with deduplication because I, I at least for me, maybe maybe I mm -hmm. missed it, um, and uh, maybe the viewers totally got this and I just missed yeah. it. But um, with deduplication, since we're calling average bar twice within our select statement, um, mm -hmm. the the deduplication applies to the fact that that expensive um, transition function is only being called once, right? Wow. Well, or it's being called for each row once. Right. So instead of instead of doing that twice, it mm -hmm. actually deduplicates the aggregate statements in the row and only runs them once and then reuses the result. And it only does that for aggregates. It doesn't do that for functions. At some point, I think they're talking about trying to, you know, the the, the facilities are there to potentially do that for functions as well. Um, right. If you have the same function call multiple times, you could in theory or parts of the same function call. Uh, the problem is that 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 gets gets into expression trees and other sorts of stuff. Anyway, it's but it 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 does do it as far as I know for aggregates, um, and and that's mostly because for aggregates it's more worth it essentially, um, because uh, basically because the um, the 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 aggregates tend to be more expensive because you're calling them for every row and getting a few results out. Um, if the, what if aggregate functions relate to different rows? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. So the aggregate functions here, uh, sort of have to be like, they're, they're both being called on, right, uh, on the, on the, on the same row. Um, and they have to be the exact same aggregate function call here. Um, so if I had average of bar and average of baz, then that would not work, right? It would obviously have to call those separately. They have to be exactly the same using the same arguments, et cetera, in order to get deduplication to work. And we'll go more into that later in this talk. So let's, let's move on for now. And, and if you want to clarify that, uh, um, question, I can go into it further later. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about custom aggregates, um, and how we might, uh, might do this. Um, so, uh, this is the, the create aggregate statement. It can be a little bit overwhelming to start, but most of this stuff we already went over. And then there's some stuff that like, isn't for today, but maybe for another time, just so if you want to use this yourself, you can, you can uh, sort of understand it. Um, so first off, if you'll remember one thing that we should remember is that the things in braces are, um, they are, uh, optional arguments. So just keep that in mind. You don't need to provide all of these things. Like the simplest thing we can do for an aggregate like max is just provide the S-funk and the, the state data type. So if it works on 
uh, a float, then like the state data type would be float, like it would be a max for floats, but um, uh, and, and need an arg data type. So create aggregate, blah, and that's how it would work. So a few things here. One, the S func, that's that state transition function that we talked about earlier. The final func and final func extra and final func modify and all sorts of other stuff. We won't go into exactly what those mean now, but um, and probably not in this uh, series of talks. You'll, you can read about that if you want to, but that's the, that f finalized function that we talked about. So we learned about that. We learned about the combined func, and it turns out that we also need for that stuff the serial, deserial func, um, as well as some uh, parallel uh, markings. So the serial and deserial functions um, an initial condition is actually not really related to these things, it's related to some other stuff, but um, the serial and deserial functions, that's what's used to send data over the wire. So if you use an internal data type for your uh, S type uh, up there, you need to provide these serial and deserial functions so that it can send the data between the instances. Cool. And then all of these M, uh, M in front of functions are for moving aggregate mode. And that's really for window functions, which we're not going to get into now. So one thing that this made me think about was were also extensions and object creation hooks. Um, and uh, thinking just a little bit more about like creating things and how our extensions actually hook into that, that, uh, that pathway. Um, that might be something interesting for people to know about. Um, like how actually do extensions work? What are the different types of extensions? What are the types of hooks that we actually use in order to uh, integrate with Postgres? And how does that happen? Um, that might be more useful maybe internally than, than externally to an extent. Um, so we may have more interest in that uh, with, with some of our um, uh, employees. And, and these talks really are, you know, for for advanced users as well, and and for and, and for users to to benefit from, but a lot of it is also for for internal use. So um, there, there's a combo there. So let me know if that's something you want to get more um, uh, interested in. Um, cool. And, and then we can do a couple examples here. Let's quickly talk about how we would use this. Um, so we can create a type, um, and we're gonna we're we're gonna call it stats, um, and it's going to have n, which is a count. Uh, and it's a big int, it's going to have sx, which is the sum of x, and sxx with the sum of x squared. Um, and we can create a function that returns the transition state of that. So we add, we we increment the count, we add to the sum, and we add the, the squared sum to, to that value. And we start off with an initial con condition of zero. So that's easy enough. Um, and you'll note that I that I marked that immutable parallel safe. So that's another thing that we can go over. We should at some point go over the volatility markings and what makes something parallel safe. That's actually like a kind of important concept, I think, that that I, I didn't mention here. But um, but volatility ca categories like immutable, stable, or volatile um, for these functions are actually a pretty important thing to understand. Um, I would definitely so, say in the future, I would love to learn about that because I'm I'm not familiar with uh, the immutable parallel um, safe. I, that's yeah, new to me. So totally cool. Throw my hat um, in the ring for that. <laughs> great. If you want to honestly stick it in the comments, just so we have a record of that. Um, <laughs> um, cool. So okay. So 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 then we can create our aggregate, and we could just register our our transition function that we just created. We registered our type. Um, and we gave it an initial condition in this case. Cool. And that works, right? So we we, we run it against our generate series, um, which is just giving us the the values from one to ten by by one tenth increments. So there are ninety one values there. Um, and I didn't actually add it up to make sure that it you know added to five hundred point five, but I'm pretty sure it works. So. Um, uh, and then we can create some different final functions for this, right? So our average, like we talked about before, is going to take our sum and divide it by the count. And then we have some more complex formulas to calculate our variance um, or our standard deviation, which probably Miranda can explain better than I can because she actually studied statistics, whereas I'm entirely a novice. Um, so we can create those as final functions. And it turns out, by the way, that you, by the way, you should not use this as a statistical aggregate because it turns out there's some weird shit that happens with double precision numbers, um, and 
keeping track of the sum of squares and the error that that accumulates from that. So don't don't do that. Um, there are better ways of doing that. And in fact, we uh, I will go over that we implemented that in a better way um, in Rust. Um, so that's a that's the thing we'll talk about later. But um, I just wanted to mention that like there's weird numerical things that happen there. Um, maybe we can get someone to come in and talk about uh, uh, double precision numbers and uh, weird weird things that happen with them. But that's a that's that's for a different day. Okay, so uh, we can create then our yeah. It's a real pain in the ass um, as it turns out. So um, anyway. Uh, so then we can create our aggregates and all we're doing here is we're adding in our final functions and then we can actually run these things, right? So we get um, that our average is 5.5 .5 and the, the variance is 6.9 and the standard deviation is 2.6, which sounds about right. It's a pretty, it's a uniform distribution there. So that makes sense. Um, cool. And then we can also make combined functions. So in this combined function, we're adding our sums adding our count sums and uh, sums of squares, right? So simple combined function, we can add that in. It's pretty easy. So that's the basic gist of how you might use um, uh, the create aggregate statement um, with just some SQL functions, but we can also use it with, with other languages. And in particular, we have been using PGX, which is um, a, a, a Postgres, uh, essentially a framework to build um, Postgres extensions in Rust. We've been using it on the, the toolkit extension, which houses a lot of our hyper functions. Um, not all of them. Some of them are integrated with the main extension. Honestly, it's the reason that the toolkit even exists is so that we can build more of that in Rust, um, which we wanted to do for speed, et cetera. Um, and more of the speed of development than speed of execution, by the way. Um, so uh, it actually is really, really, really nice for that. So let me just uh, like... Just to give you some stats on that, right? It manages over 600 custom types, functions, and operators for us, and really reduces the complexity of handling all of those and speeds our development. Um, so that's really the main reason that we use it in the toolkit extension for a lot of the work on on hyperfunctions. At some point, we might, you know, we want to figure out how to make that easier to install and all that stuff. But that's that's for a little bit later. Um, so one thing that I can tell you about, about building things with um, PGX, right? We want to really uh, take advantage of Rust's sort of inherent safety, the way that it that it uses the compiler to make sure that the, the code that you're writing is safer um, beforehand. So, but you once you're integrating with Postgres, it's much harder for Rust to figure that out for you because now you're interacting with this other system that it can't see. So as much as possible, we've tried to keep a lot of the logic, the main logic of the, the program in a separate Rust crate that we can compile separately and test separately. And then we basically have a somewhat standard, not completely standard, but a, a more standard API that sees into that, uh, or that, 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 that hooks into that so that, that the, um, the Rust compiler can check a lot of the the the, the logic based code and the algorithm part um, beforehand, and then it's the integrations with Postgres interactions with Postgres we can make a little bit more standard in some cases at least. So that's one sort of design pattern. So we actually have those in separate files in their own. Um, in this case, it's called the stats ag folder, right? And we made a stats uh, a stats ag. It, it has we have a one D version and a two dimensional version, so that that can take two different types. Um, and this allows us to write not in SQL, but in um, uh, in Rust. Um, it allows us to use the the like Rust types and other sorts of stuff. And it, it, and it allows us, I mean, it allows us to do slightly more complex checks a little bit more easily as well. So this is the Young's Kramer method, which is like that better way of doing the double precision uh, calculations. Um, and we have various ways that we did various checks. We actually used the Postgres uh, implementation for part of it, or like re-implemented in Rust. And then we also added in some more um, moments. 
we, we, we added a uh, third and fourth moment so that we can add some more statistical stuff on top of that. So that's cool. Um, that's one thing that I would just recommend if you're thinking about PGX, but uh, something that you could use. I think there's actually a talk that James just gave about working with PGX as well. Um, so you could take a look at that if you're interested in learning more about that as well. Um, we also have macros that we used uh, to generate some of the, the aggregates, but this is uh, getting a little bit beside the point. So let's let's get back to our custom aggregate um, uh, stuff that we're talking about. So one of the things that we do with hyperfunctions is we use something that, that we call two-step aggregates. And what that really means is that we have an inner aggregate call. In this case, it's stats ag or percentile ag. And then we have an outer accessor call. So um, that would be average or approximate percentile, approx percentile, right? And that is um, where, uh, so, so, so essentially what you can think about that as is as when we're talking about the functions in Postgres, like the transition function and final function, each one of those is an analogous function in the two-step aggregate design path. So we have a transition function, right? That is essentially like the aggregate. So stats ag and percentile ag are actually producing a state that can be used to then apply the final function, which we call an accessor later. And then we also have something called the combined function. And this combined function is not going to be, is going to be standard across lots of different functions. So it's called roll up. And so you can always roll up one of these, uh, the output of stats ag or the output of percentile ag into a larger bucket or across different values or various different ways that you could do that roll up. Um, so it allows us to apply the combined function, um, which normally is completely boxed into Postgres and like you can't do that on your own. It needs to happen inside of an aggregate. We've made it so that you can do that on your own. And we'll see why that's useful in a minute. And so the main goals of hyperfunction of this hyperfunctions API, right, is we wanted to work within the SQL language. We wanted it intuitive for both new and experienced SQL users, and we wanted to make things essentially useful for a few rows, but also high performance with billions. And so you have to make sure that you're making the right kinds of trade-offs um, in your API design to do this. So, um, and I'll let you read the rest of this, but. Essentially, like the making fundamental things simple and, and more advanced analyses possible is another big part of that, um, and, and making sure things play well with with with, with time scale. So I'll let you read this part. Um, we're going to go over each of these in turn, though. So why is this useful? Well, one thing is that we want to make sure that we can reuse state effectively. So for instance, when we talked about deduplication before, we said that that average of the value that that um, uh, that expression could be dedu deduplicated, but it can only be deduplicated if they're exactly the same. So Postgres doesn't know, and it would have really no way of knowing that average of val divided by two is the same as average of val divided by two. So you have to write the function in a way that Postgres is going to understand in order for it to know how to optimize it and deduplicate it effectively. So when we are designing an API, we really want to make sure that we designed it in such a way that users are going to naturally do the right thing. Because if we do it this way, it can't figure it out. So we want to make it hard for users to write low, low performance code. And like this is this is um, another topic that we could go into some more, right? We could talk about how we do API design and the importance of prototyping and for instance, the experimental schemas that we started using in toolkit especially um, to, to great effect, I think, right? We often change the API once or twice before we release it. And that that prototyping step has been really, really helpful for us. Um, so yeah, anyway. So two-step aggregation and deduplication. So what we did, so so this is like, we want this to be treat these two things to be treated the same. We want percentile ag a valve that occurs multiple times with approximate percentile here to be treated exactly the same as if we'd said select percentile ag 
and then done a prox percentile 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9. Because that, that means that our aggregate is only being run once. It's not being run three times. If we had a single step aggregate that did this, it would need to take two values, the target value as well as the value that we're doing the aggregate on. And that can't be deduplicated because now these are different function calls. Does that make sense to folks? So because that value changes, now we can't deduplicate it. Here, the accessor argument changes, and those are going to be called differently, and that's that's what we want, right? The, the, the accessor needs to be called multiple times. But the aggregate argument is constant, which means that that can be deduplicated. And again, this goes back to that the transition function is getting called once per row versus the final function, which is getting called once per group of rows. It's the same here with the aggregate and the accessor. The aggregate is called once per row, and the accessor is called once per group of rows. Cool. So that's two-step aggregation and deduplication. We try to make this so that the design works uh, very nicely for users. And it also means that we can have different accessors, right? And it's clear when that's happening. So we can we, we have that same percentile lag, a val, and we have different accessors. We can get the error. We can get the approximate percentile rank, which is sort of the inverse of the percentile, where it says, if I gave you this value, what percentile would it be, right? And so those can be even of different data types. Right, error just takes one value instead of taking a, a second thing. Right, so that's a really interesting way that this allows you to work. So, and 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 the default option here, right, to call it multiple times, is the high performance option. We don't need to tell users, hey, you know, you should really call select percentile ag and then do this and blah 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 blah. We want it to be the default way that you do it, and whichever way the user decides to do it, it should just work. Cool. So that's really one one way that time scale kind of differs then from like the Postgres um, aggregation functions is that, you know, we kind of at time scale, how we set it up, we allow for uh, users to have those differences within the function itself and not have to, you know, re. Yeah. And um, this was inspired by the way that Postgres designed its own APIs. We mm -hmm. just wanted to make that more accessible to the user because we thought it was such a good API that was currently really only being exposed to like the DBA or someone who's creating custom aggregates, which is not a normal user. Mm -hmm. Right. And instead mm -hmm. we wanted to unify that for as many aggregates as we could. So that's part of why we also re-implemented a few Postgres aggregates and there may be more that we need to do this for. And so if you have aggregates that you, you think we should uh, do this for, please let us know because we're happy to, 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 to add in some more. Um, so yeah. Um, anyway, the other thing that we want this to do, and I'm going to go through this one quickly, is we want to cleanly distinguish between the parameters that affect the aggregate versus the one that affect the accessors because that has performance implications. Right, so it turns out that for, for percentile ag, um, it's actually a version of UDD sketch, which is um, uh, a percentile approximation algorithm. And that can take its own parameters. So I can have a thousand buckets um, and a target error of 0 0.001 um, or a hundred buckets and target error of 0 0.1 in this case. Um, and that the, the the arguments that are affecting that aggregate parameter are very clearly distinguished by the fact that they're in the parentheses around the aggregate in, in the aggregate function rather than in like the overall parentheses. So if I had just all of these, like if these were all just one function, then like it would be really hard to tell which of these things was actually affecting the aggregate versus affecting the, the sort of accessor part. And it's just like kind of confusing. Um, so I think it's actually much more readable the other way. And that also means that it, it helps us know which ones are actually going to affect. Like I actually have to run UDD sketch twice here once because these two are the exact same, right? So that, that will run once on the row. And then because these inputs are different, I have to run it again with those inputs. Okay, but maybe the most important thing is enabling these easy to understand rollups with logically consistent results in continuous aggregates, for instance, in other places. And by the way, this uh, this 
reminds me, and I think I'll mention this in a minute, that we haven't really covered continuous aggregates yet. That's something we should con we should cover at some point soon. Um, so that's something uh, to know. But a continuous aggregate is a is a way to create um, uh, a, a sort of materialized a materialized view that's up updated automatically that we provide. Um, and so if we it, like if we look at these two things, it's not necessarily clear. that this versus this right is a, is the same right if i say the sum of the value from my table versus the sum of the sums that i computed in a in a separate uh clause right that turns out to create the same value but if i do the average of averages that's not true right and i know that about sums and averages i might know that about um uh, about various other things, about various other functions, but I don't know about all of the aggregate functions that could possibly exist. And it's just kind of hard to know. So we wanted to provide a way so that you knew that it worked. And if I, if I do this in continuous aggregate context, right? Like, I don't know which ones I can do this for and which ones I can't. Um, so it's really helpful to, to have this roll up function that says reaggregation is allowed and it's, it ha provides some guarantees that it's going to be at least reasonably uh, reasonably close. Um, there are a few of our functions where they are approximations and the order of the inputs matters. Um, so those, you're not necessarily going to get the exact same results when you run rollup, but we always note that in the function call um, themselves. And, you, and because they're approximations anyway, like they're non-deterministic, so you just deal with it. Um, uh, anyway, the... Uh, the nifty thing about this is that you can run roll up on all these different things. And if you can run roll up, then it just works. In this case, we're going, we're doing a roll up from a 15 minute time bucket into a one day time bucket. And I can just do that on the result and, and have that work. We also have a fun thing that uh, like with StatsAg where we can do rolling, um, which allows us to do tumbling windows uh, and, and the like. And, and those are really, really helpful for a lot of different cases. Um, we could, in fact, I have done a few uh, videos on on just this sort of window function and 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 that stuff. Um, is there a way to share an example, Jay? What sort of example do you mean? Um, so this is the type of thing that I would I would think about. So this is a rolling thirty minute average um, with actually a tumbling five minute window. Um, and I have a whole set of talks on window functions. So this is actually another area that we can get more deeply into our window functions and how this sort of stuff works. Um, yeah, I, I, and if you would like to share uh, an example use case, that would be amazing. Uh, please do let us know. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I think that honestly, the best place to do that would be on the community forum. Um, if you either want feedback on it or um, just to share as as a thing, and we can maybe someone will also reach out to you because they might want to do a blog post or something like that uh, with uh, with your example use case. We would love an example use case, so please please do share that, um, Miranda. Maybe you can share the community forum link. Um, Already ahead of you. So cool. Um, and then the other reason that we want to do this is to allow easier retrospective analysis of downsampled data. So continuous aggregates, you can drop the the underlying data. Um, and then you can uh, uh, keep using it, even though the underlying data is gone. Um, and so, yeah, this is, we need to go over continuous aggregates, we need to go over data retention, we need to go over all that stuff. I think that would be a really good thing to, to cover. Um, continuous aggregates, we're doing a little bit of work on right now, and I think they're going to be a little bit easier to explain in a month or two or whenever we release this, which hopefully will be pretty soon. I know that that's uh, being worked on now, though, so that's exciting. Um, not announcement. I'm not on the product team. Please don't kill me. Um, I can make no guarantees about dates of release or anything like that. But I do know <laughs> there's work going on. You're going to have some <sighs> <laughs> interesting Slack messages this afternoon. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, we should go over continuous aggregates. It's going to happen. I'm very excited. Um, and y'all should be too. Um, so one of the things that I really love about this is that if I, and I would recommend this, whenever you create a continuous aggregate, do it with the, um, uh, 
the um, uh, with just the uh, aggregate part before you've applied the final function. Um, so in this case, it's percentile lag. And then I can decide in my query, hey, I want the median or hey, I want the 90th percentile. Um, and I can do that later. Um, and in this case, I forgot to fix this, but uh, I, I was trying to say that, hey, at first you just want the median. You don't have to put it in your aggregate, in, in, in your continuous aggregate itself. You can just say like, I want the median. And then later when my requirements change, I can actually, uh, so this is this is backwards. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it's not backwards, but uh, like it allows you to do different levels of aggregation. It also allows you to do uh, different types of uh, percentiles here, right? And so that is really, really helpful um, for a number of different use cases and it really makes it much nicer um, that I can decide later what I want and, and get a lot more flexibility because if when I'm storing that state, um, it allows me to uh, sort of keep some more stuff around at relatively low cost, um, still a lot less data, right? Even if I have four or five values for maybe for a 15 minute period where I might have a million, right? So it's a, it's a pretty simple trade-off there. So then we can just change the query in rather than changing the aggregate. So that's it. And this was the end of the original talk. Um, and that's also where we'll end our lesson today. Um, I hope that for this real this time useful for y'all. Yeah, I. Yeah. <laughs> this time we're actually going to we're actually at the end. Look, I can hit that dang button; it doesn't do anything. Um, uh, so, um, that is uh, Jay. What did you get? I'm uh, um, my my amazing humor. That's what he gets. Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't <laughs> the tiger. Um, oh, because we're shipping into space. I don't know because Eon's the cutest tiger. Yeah, yeah he's a very <laughs> cute tiger. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's that's the the end there. I am uh, happy to answer any more questions that folks have. Folks have if you are. Um, uh, if there are anything that, that comes up now, and I really would love, um, you know, as folks are watching this later, if you want to put in the comments, what, what would interest you to do some more? Um, or I think, you know, people put some comments in, um, if you want to like, like those comments, um, and just like with ones that, that you wanted to go more like over more, um, that would be really helpful for determining where the rest of this course goes. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so we'll be back, I think in two weeks. Um, uh, we do have um, a question if you would yeah. like to. Uh, so this is a somewhat yeah. long one. What is the performance of um, PL, PG, SQL functions? Is it a good idea to use them not only for aggregates, but for some pre-processing processing before insert trigger? Um, yeah. yeah. So... Um, PLPG SQL is not as performant as, say, C or Rust, um, in, in term, uh, like, and, and there's a bit of infrastructure that has to be spun up for every PLPG SQL function call. Um, it's something that I would, you know, I, I don't like using PLPG SQL whenever possible. I, I try to avoid it for aggregates, especially because they're getting called like a lot of times and there can be some overhead to that. It shouldn't be too bad for most aggregates, especially if they're marked immutable and if there's some plan caching that can happen there and other stuff. But um, in, in general, it's not, it was not made for performance. It was made for convenience mm -hmm. and safety. Um, so like if you are really performance sensitive, PLPG SQL is not is, is often not as great a way to go. Um, and certainly if you, if you're doing before insert triggers, right, they can be great, but they will also slow down your in, ingest rate. Like that's just, that's going to happen. Um, we've designed for instance, our continuous aggregate triggers in C to be very performant. Um, and, uh, you know, keep track of a very small amount of data and other sorts of stuff. Um, but if you're doing more complex, Triggers, they're going to take longer. Um, let me shut off the, for this, I don't think I need the slides. Um, 
so they are they are going to take longer um and and it, so that's something to keep in mind um it's not to say that it's not useful in any um uh in, in any context but in certain contexts um it could be not the best way to go um i think the you know one thing that you could do is explain your use case uh and if there's something that that we can help with we can try to do that i don't know that that, that it's like it could be a feature request maybe um if it's a common enough use case that it's something that we can help build um there are, but there are certainly cases where where some sort of before insert trigger can can help you can also sometimes use your application to do it um so especially with the insert path um, you can sometimes use the application side, especially if the application is relatively controlled, right? I, I'd pref you know, it would be great if we could figure out some of the performance issues around that and provide a way to do some more of that, but it can be a little bit hard to make that really safe. Um, so there's just a, there's, there's a bit of a trade-off there. And I think, um, you know, I would say use judiciously, uh, test the performance for yourself, see if you're getting the performance that you need. If you are, then great. And it's a great way to, to to work on things. It's a really good tool, um, but you don't expect it to be like the same ingest rate as you got without the trigger. Mm. So, awesome! Thank you for that explanation. Um, we do have another question. Bom, bom. Is the next session about continuous aggregates and or materialized views and or time bucket? Um, I don't know. Uh, I actually haven't really planned the next session yet, so I can't tell you that just yet. Uh, um, uh, let me think about that and let you know. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll see, but it's, it sounds like you want, uh, continuous aggregates as, as something that could be good for the next session. Um, I think that that, that could be something that could be useful for us. Um, I, uh, we'll definitely get there eventually, yeah. even if it's not the next session, um, that is definitely on our list as well. So, <laughs> um, also, uh, and noting um, just uh, what kind of Jay brought up um, to the to the chat, the idea of like if you have a use case where you're using any of these functions, or if you have questions um, like Plumman, um, specifically with PLPG SQL functions, um, totally feel free to share any of those questions or use cases or whatever on the forum or Slack, um, particularly in the forum, that can be a great place to do that because we'll, uh, we monitor that a little bit more from the engineering side. Um, and so like definitely start up that conversation there if you have things that you want to talk about or even just share. Um, cause yeah. we, we love that. And, um, would love to. Yeah. Like and one thing you can do in it. Slack also is, you know, ask about how you're formulating a question for the forum or something like that. So if you want, if you're like, I'm not sure how to, how to mm -hmm. ask this well, like Slack can be a great place to ask that and then get a, get a better formulation so that your, your answers in the forum, which, you know, Slack tends to be a little bit more real time, whereas the forum tends to be a little bit more asynchronous. Um, and, and you can expect to wait a little bit longer, but a little bit more permanent and hopefully you can get into a little bit of a deeper technical discussion that then we can refer back to for other people. So we're willing to invest a little more time in it. Whereas with Slack, like it goes away after a little while. And so we can't even say, here's a link if you have a similar question <laughs> um, later. And so it feels like the work just sort of disappears. Um, so thank you, everyone. This was lovely. Um, really good to to talk to y'all and uh, we will see you in a couple weeks. Yeah. And thank you for being so active on the chat, everyone. This is, yeah. it makes it way more fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we really appreciate uh, both Jay and Plamen for all of your questions and comments and stuff. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. Like David said, thank you so much. Um, we'll see you in two weeks.